Welcome to the Industrial Logistics Webinar, Q1 2020. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please type them into the Q&A panel. The team will try to address your questions during the Q&A session or contact you after the webinar. Now, I'm pleased to introduce you the Head of Industrial Logistics, Len Rosso. Good afternoon and a warm welcome to you all. Um, firstly, before we start, I'd like to thank Ian Henderson, Group Property Director of Wynn Canton for joining our guest panel today. Uh, we'll start the uh, webinar now. Over to Andrea Ferranti, Head of Industrial Logistics Research for Colliers in the UK. Thank you very much, Len. Uh, first of all, a, a few housekeeping things. Um, the webinar will run for, for about one hour maximum. That includes the Q&A uh, section. Today we're going to cover lots of different topics. I'm not going to list them all now, but we'll hear from, um, from my colleagues uh, in the regional agencies uh, throughout the country and Scotland as well. Then as Len just mentioned, Ian Henderson, Group Property Director of uh, Wincanton, will share some of his latest view and how Wincanton is actually uh, trying to weather this challenging business environment with their client base. If we now move on to the first slide here. So here I thought it was be interesting to look at how the economy is doing. Um, for these reasons, I've included here some of the latest forecasts or scenario horizons for, I mean, from the Bank of England, the Office for Budget Responsibility, and the ONS. So, so here, what we're looking at, we're looking at annual growth for GDP in the UK. According to the latest uh, figures, the OBR is actually expecting a drop, an annual drop in Q2 2020 of about 13%. This is off the back of um, a quarterly uh, decrease of about 35% due to uh, the reasons around pandemic, lockdown, distancing measures. But what we, the main reason why we're looking at this chart, if you look up towards the right hand side, is how the economy is expected to bounce back strongly in 2021. So 2021, according to this analysis, we'll see an annual growth of about 70%, so stronger the decrease that we will experience by the end of this year. This makes us think that <clears throat> economists are actually expecting a V-shaped recovery, whereby economic activity will bounce back very strongly once the lockdown measures are either eased and then we can actually go back to some sort of normality. But if we now move on to the industrial logistics sector, so here we will, we're looking at a quarterly take up for lettings under 1,000 square foot plus. January and February, I mean, undoubtedly were good months, but March, of course, so a, a strong slowdown in activity. Q1 2020, so about 7.5 million square feet of take up. And why this is 10% higher than what we saw in Q1 2019, it is roughly 20% down on, a, on the Q1 five year average, particularly shown here in this chart. So there are lots of different reasons and factors. So what we're trying to do now throughout this webinar is just to add some flavor to these figures. And speaking of which, I would like to bring in Len Rosso just to add a little bit of an extra flavor to what he's seeing in the market lately with our clients. Thanks, Len. Over to you. Thanks, Andrea. As you can see from the slide there, 2020 Q1 was positive. It was up from Q1 2019. I think what's important uh, from the webinar audience is to get a feel for where the market's at. And from our perspective, uh, Colliers currently have uh, six requirements 
of over half a million square feet, which we're currently looking prior to the COVID-19 pandemic hitting us. Uh, out of those six requirements, four of those are still going ahead, which is really positive. I would say the four which are going ahead do have an online offering, which I think is a key uh, differentiator between the other two. The other thing to say is from a Collier's uh, perspective, we normally undertake about 300 transactions every year and we get a run rate of around 25 each month. So for the end of March, normally we'd be expecting around 75 transactions to take in place. To date, uh, we've had 60, which is obviously 20% uh, down on our normal sort of uh, run rate. Um, that said, you could argue that's not such a big impact, um, which I feel is true, but I think the longer this pandemic goes on, the more of an effect it will have on the transactions. Um, I think the other thing to talk about is the short-term requirements which have come out of this pandemic. Um, the first one is through the supermarkets. Um, what we've seen initially, uh, if we went back three or four weeks, there was a very strong demand from most of the supermarket operators for short-term space. What we then experienced is once we went down as a lockdown, with the social distancing, this had an impact on the amount of space they required. And what I mean by that is, for example, if you go into a large supermarket and normally you get a couple of hundred people in there. With the social distancing, that has come down to, we believe, 30 or 40 broadly, which means whilst they're still having strong demand for all their products, they're not selling quite the run rate they were previous to the lockdown. Um, because of that, um, we've seen a drop in some of the size requirements for some of those supermarkets. The other sector where we feel there will, uh, we see quite a bit of demand is from the clothes retailers. Um, for example, uh, most of the clothes retailers uh, would have hoped to sell their spring stock by now, but that hasn't been the case. Um, they're all shut and the ones with no online offering are struggling even more. What we find though, is that they've now got their summer stock coming over from China, Turkey, other destinations. Um, because of that, uh, they're going to need more storage space. That said, it's likely to be short term, I'd say anything from six to uh, 12 months, but we have seen a big uptick in that. This is obviously going to cause them some prof uh, problems from a profitability perspective because obviously it will be costing more money to store their product. Um, one of the other things is we've seen a number of challenges ourselves, uh, predominantly with uh, undertaking viewings. The other one is the low level of inquiries in the market generally. That said, uh, there are still a number of companies out there looking. And from our perspective, what's very important is that when we do have an acquiry which is live, we try and land it on behalf of our clients, which is paramount. Of course, the other thing is to make sure we're in constant contact with our customers to let them know what's happening, what we're seeing, et cetera. Uh, the other thing to talk about briefly is the investment market. It's very difficult to gauge where things are at, but in our view, if a prime investment in the logistics sector, albeit big box or multi-let, did come to the market, we believe it would attract a very sharp yield, if not a record one. Uh, finally, um, from my perspective, we do feel uh, there will be structural changes to the industrial logistics sector, and we believe these are very positive. And for the uh, short and medium term, we believe they have a very uh, positive impact. And what I mean by that is obviously through this, um, lockdown, it's been shown that more and more people are buying online and we believe that trend will only continue. Consequently, we'll need more warehouse space for that. The other thing is um, it's been proven a couple of companies have struggled uh, with their supply chain and it maybe hasn't been quite as robust as they anticipated. Because of that, we feel when we come out of this, they'll be looking to upgrade their logistics space. Uh, on that note, Andrea, I'll hand back to you. Thank you very much, Len, for this uh, introductory overview. 
So now what we want to do, I just, I'm not going to add much in terms of what, what Len just mentioned, but moving on to um, rental dynamics. So here, what you're seeing, you're seeing the latest MSCI XIPD data uh, on a monthly basis. These are for March. So that includes roughly one or two weeks uh, of lockdown um, that we witnessed. The first thing I'd like to point out here, if you look at the monthly data, the red bar, particularly in London, we actually saw 0.4 percentage growth, which shows an acceleration of rental growth when compared to the quarterly three months, particularly. Distribution warehouses actually stand really well as well with 0.2 percentage growth. But where we see some pressure uh, is a standard industrial rest of UK segment. There, I, I believe, is because, of course, the further away you go from London or densely populated areas, perhaps outside the Midlands, you're more likely to see uh, not primer stock, particularly non-core location. Hence, when sentiments are dented, um, rest of UK standard industrial might actually be affected. But if we analyze at the sample, that might be the case where a larger proportion of non-prime assets is actually within this sample. The real test, uh, in our view, is actually um, trying to analyze the quarterly data, which should be coming out over the next few weeks for Q1 2020. And then the ultimate test would be Q2 2020, because there were some data, economics data and market sentiment would have filtered through to the real economy and the market. But if we look at the wider picture, why we remain very positive, particularly in those markets where there is a tight supply, all in all, because of the current situation, we expect rents plateauing, particularly headline rents. Um, with incentives in some markets moving out because of the current uncertainty. But trying to address this at the moment, particularly with the rent payments, rent deferrals, et cetera, we've done a work with our international investment property management team. If you look at the next slide, which is coming up now. So here we worked really closely with our colleagues right away trying to understand how well occupiers were actually uh, handling this situation in terms of rental payments. Um, I should point out here that this is mainly um, England analysis because Scotland's got different quarter and date. But nevertheless, it's a great sample. As you can see, the first week after the quarter day uh, rental collection, 80% of the rents for big box, I mean, I should say for large distribution warehouses, 100,000 square foot plus, were paid. Mid box uh, yielded a 65% proportion with smaller units, a multi-let actually suffering the most. Our view is that because of uh, the smaller end of the market, it's primarily uh, small and medium enterprises, then hence having some issues with cash flows because of the smaller business they're operating in. Lenny will say a few words here, but before I hand you over to him again and see what um, some of our clients have been uh, looking at this data and etc., we should really see the next quarter day collection to get a better picture of what's actually going on in the market. Back to you, Len, please. Thanks, Andrea. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, pretty obvious, really. Obviously, the larger companies are uh, finding their generally uh, cash reserves are larger. Um, I think speaking to some of our clients, what we've seen is that it is more problematic the one thing which is consistent, if you do uh, engage with your clients and customers and find out where their challenges are, you'll definitely get more rent in than you would if you just don't engage with them. 
you know, speaking to some of our clients, such as Prologis, they were saying they had in excess of 90% of their rent collected. Uh, the other big box uh, read would be Tritax Symmetry. Uh, we understand uh, from their shareholders' announcement that they had 96% of their rent collected. Um, I don't think this surprises us. I think when we come to the June quarter, it'll be interesting to see where we get to. That said, I think the rents collected on the big box arena are still going to be substantially more than the mid box. Uh, back to you, Andre. Thanks again, Len. Um, now I'd like you to uh, I'd like to introduce um, Ian Henderson, a Group Property Director in Winkington, just to get a different perspective. Hi, Ian. If you can uh, just um, tell us how you actually experiencing and your clients, how they're dealing in this uh, challenging business environment. Just checking with Ian. I think we, we would definitely we would we would expect we we'll go back to Ian. We we'll go back to Ian. We might have some expected IT issues here. Nevertheless, um, Ian would be able to share his view soon. If we move on to to the next slide here, what I want to talk about about Simon Norton will be discussing some of the key trends in the manufacturing automotive sector and the global backdrop, how some of these occupiers are actually operating in this environment. Simon, over to you, please. Thanks, Andre, and hi, everyone. I hope you're uh, all well enjoying another rainy day in the UK during lockdown. Um, as Andre has said, I'm, I'm here just to briefly discuss our, our sort of overview uh, position on the manufacturing sector and, and what we've seen, um, particularly in the UK, but also globally as well. It does vary across continents and we, we are actually seeing um, with the phased introduction of social distancing unlocking, uh, this is starting to ease things up in the manufacturing sectors, predominantly starting in China and then that's sweeping across Europe and then hopefully um, there has been some announcements, I think we'll start to see some social easing, shall we say, in the UK um, and this should help start the engine up in terms of manufacturing. I think that the, the key areas that have suffered and are suffering are the, um, <clears throat> the aerospace uh, industries and uh, the auto industry as well, along with their associated supply chains. I mean, the, the UK is a bit of a bit of an engine for the UK in terms of manufacturing, etc. And um, a lot of that has come to a halt recently, major manufacturing in terms of um, auto and uh, aerospace. And it's got obviously repercussions across the whole supply chain. Um, put that into an example, Rolls-Royce's current share price, it's down 50%. Um, it was running at circa nine, 10 pounds. Um, and that's now sub five pounds. Um, Mega Aerospace are a very big uh, operator. They've got a big facility in Coventry at Anstey. Um, they've recently announced that they are gonna make about 1800 people redundant across, across the world. Um, they've also put a halt on their dividend at the moment. So not a great picture. And I think there will be some, some elements, you know, where the UK is affected by that. And I think yesterday or the day before, or maybe over the weekend, Airbus, you know, they voiced their concerns about what's going on. They're saying that they're bleeding cash. Air, you know, they're, they're talking about cutting their aircraft production by approximately a third. Um, obviously, there's huge amounts of planes sitting on runways, not doing anything. No one's flying anywhere. So, you know, there's all that knock-on effect with the supply chain, food, maintenance, etc. So. Yeah, unfortunately, not, not a fantastic picture at the moment. Switching over to the, um, <clears throat> to the auto sector, again, West Midlands, very much focused on the auto. Jaguar Land Rover, very, very big manufacturer in the region. Uh, they recently re uh, released their uh, fiscal year ending March 20 figures for sales. And um, year on year, they were 12.1% down against the previous year and then during the last quarter of 
uh, the financial year up till March, their figures were down 30.9% compared with the same period. So disappointing, but again, affected probably by that China piece. Um, big market for them, Range Rover, it's a very profitable bit of business. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens there. Obviously China's coming online, etc. They have announced that, uh, well, sorry, as part of those figures, they did, there were some positives to take from that. So they've got some new models that come forward, the new Range Rover Revoke, they, they were up about 25% uh, in terms of sales year on year, and along with their, their I-Pace as well, which was uh, you know, quite an innovative uh, electric vehicle, and that's up 40%. So, you know, again, some positives to take from there. On the, again, on the auto industry, Tier one suppliers, tier two suppliers, again, a lot of them are clustered around the Midlands um, and colleagues actually act for a number of these guys. And um, the feedback that we're getting is they're in the same position, they're having to shut down, furlough people um, until um, the, the, the key manufacturers get online and start producing again. You know, they have to, they have to shut down, but hopefully that will, will come online once the, the manufacturers uh, start production again. It's not all doom and gloom. If we look at the green shoots, you know, for instance, in China, JLR have announced and are producing vehicles out of their, their plant there. Um, production's running well. I think demand is, is, is ramping up as well. Car showrooms are open in, in China. Um, and there is probably an element of people maybe wanting to social distance rather than get on public transport. So people might be buying cars um so that's that's a positive and i think that, that for the uk particularly again for the midlands great news um jaguar land rover announced that they are going to open their solihull plant um, along with their nitra plant where they they're going to manufacture this great uh, new defender that they've, they've put out there it is only going to be on a one shift pattern and i think it's going to be very much customer led uh, in terms of orders and build um so but that should happen. I think they're talking about May in line with the government guidance. So that, that will be a positive. And then interestingly, they've also released two new models uh, over the last week, two petrol hybrids. Um, so it just shows, you know, in the background, these guys are working hard to keep the business going. And uh, I think it will be a positive for, for the region. I think just, just stepping into the European arena, um, Magnus Steyr, they are a third party manufacturer. They've opened up uh, their plant and are producing again vehicles for Mercedes um, out, of, out of Graz. And then interestingly, VW, they've got um, quite, quite a big plant in near Leipzig where they just started production again on a one, one shift basis for their ID uh, electric car, which will be an exciting uh, vehicle for the, for the future. And then uh, again in the UK, Aston Martin, they've been, you know, they've had their woes in the press recently. They've got some new funding, uh, new guys involved and uh, hopefully pushing forward. And they're going to open up their, their, their new Welsh uh, facility where they're bringing out this new crossover. So I think there will be some relief for the sector, but I don't think we'll see those indicators come through until probably end of Q2, Q3, subject to where the sales figures are and the number of vehicles that they are pushing out. I think interestingly, though, just touching on the on the retail side, um, the government have granted this ability to to dealers to deliver cars directly to customers on curbside rather than to the dealerships themselves. Um, so I think that you know that little bit of easing again will help things. Um, and then talking to our guys in the automotive sector, we've got a quite a strong team there. They via one of their custom sorry by via one of their clients. Yeah, you know, they've reported um, sales in excess of 650 vehicles during this lockdown period, which you know is pretty pretty phenomenal, really. Um, I think there's a lot of people there with maybe saving money, looking again at the social distancing piece. Um, so I think that will only increase. And then again reading an article this morning while i was uh, sitting in the car park went for my wife to do the do the shopping um there's talk about franchise dealerships they're receiving quite a strong level of inquiries for new vehicles uk um vehicles uh vehicle sales are very much predicated on pcp 
and lease deals. And there's a, there's a cycle to those, so it'd be two or three years. And they're, they're getting strong levels of interest coming through on that. And I think that's probably potentially a good indicator of consumer habits uh, and what we may sort of forecast looking forward. And a little bit of, I think I've touched on in another video, talking about the spending revenge, which they've seen in China. Hopefully that will follow through in the UK. So I suppose to, to link all that into how it, how it works on the commercial property sector, I think there will be some, some changes. I think some of the multinationals um, on the manufacturing side will do a little bit of safe harbouring. I think there'll be some plants that might close. There'll be some plants that may expand uh, in the UK and globally. Um, so there'll be some net gains and net losses for the UK. But positives are we've got a fantastic skill base. We've, you know, we're renowned in terms of R&D and manufacturing. So I think we're, we're relatively resilient in that, in that sector. Um, but I do think that there will maybe some opportunities in terms of plants coming forward as they're vacated. So um, over the next 12 months, I think it's watch this space really. But um, yeah, look at the positives and let's all move forward. Um, stay safe, everyone. And I'll just hand you over now to my colleague, Rob, Rob Watmuff. Um, who's based out of Leeds, who's um, going to take up the next slot. Thanks very much. Thanks, Simon. Um, I'll now touch on the, the UK logistics market. Um, and currently, I think we've all seen a number of, of COVID-19 related short term requirements. Um, as Len touched on earlier on, initially these were generally grocery related, um, but now appear to have shifted to other product areas. With regards to the grocery supply chain issues, these look to have been resolved largely. Um, initially, problems were centered around staffing, self-isolation measures, um, but the grocery sector saw an in excess of 20% absenteeism three weeks ago um, when the measures came in. Um, as of last week, this was down to less than 10%. Um, and obviously the panic buying um, scenario that uh, was, uh, was initially witnessed um, seems to have ceased as well. Again, as, as Len touched on, the, the main area um, that, that seems to be worst hit is, is clothing. Um, March saw a fall in general sales in clothing by 35% uh, compared to the previous month. Now, this is obviously to be expected as, as clothing stores remained closed. Um, however, looking at the online, which is obviously going to be quite a big, big focus at the moment, um, clothing was the only sector to see a decrease in the value of online sales as well. That was actually down over 16% um, compared to um, a plus 1.7% for the same period last year. So a sub substantial drop in online sales of clothing. If we go back to supermarkets as an example, um, in March 2020, the value for food, household goods, other non-food related items, all increased sales uh, on the previous month by an excess of 15%. Um, by contrast, clothing, um, that actually declined dramatically uh, by close to 30% um, compared to a plus 3.3% in the previous year, same period previous year. Um, we're aware at the moment of a couple of, well, a number of live COVID related clothing um, storage requirements within the marketplace. Um, and we envisage major stockpiling of, of seasonal stock, um, which could run on 12, 18 months. So, and watch this space in terms of those larger scale requirements coming out there. In, uh, in terms of the wider online, um, context using Amazon as a, as a barometer really. Um, as would be expected that for, because of the nature of their platform, they've continued to trade extremely well um, and have recently announced a further 5,000 jobs being created in the UK. Um, also pay increases for both fulfillment centre workers and, and those involved in delivery uh, positions. However, due to the increase in orders that they've, they've seen, new customers, um, and the lack of available delivery drivers, um, added pressures uh, to enforce social distances within its warehouses. Even Amazon's net, their network is struggling to provide its usual speedy delivery service. Um, I think online is obviously a major factor within our industry at the moment. Um, and 
the reliance of online, particularly food as an essential item, has been highlighted by the pandemic. And this surge in online consumer habits, we, we definitely expect to continue. Um, we don't think it's a flash in the pan. Um, a few interesting online stats that, uh, that, that have recently been calculated. Online sales as a proportion of all retailing reached a record high of 22.3% in March this year. Supermarkets themselves saw an increase of just shy of 18% on online food. Department stores, obviously with, with the high streets closed, they saw a monthly increase of, of just shy of 50% um, compared to last year, 0.1% uh, for March. Household goods, they were up just shy of 37% um, compared to a decline of 4% in the same period of last year. Um, and fridge freezers uh, apparently are the pick of the, the product at the moment. Um, we already know how dependent our, uh, our sector is on retail. Um, and we, we envisage these, these changes in consumer behaviour will, will continue and continue to drive e-commerce related property requirements. Um, the continued growth that we're seeing, um, it's only going to be limited in our opinion by the supply side responses can occupiers um, physically upscale um, and you know what impact is the current land property supply side constraints going to have is that going to be the, the limiting factor i think ultimately yes it is from a speed perspective um, the social distancing uh, measures we expect to continue um, it certainly won't be a an immediate end to those um, could last up to 18 months. What impact is this going to have on, on the property sector, supply chains, larger footprints of buildings, you know, cubic capacity? Is that going to come more and more into play? Uh, we think that's the case anyway. We think you know people are going to be looking for that value in height uh, to maximise their offering. In terms of, of supply, um, obviously the construction industry has seen has been impacted on quite badly albeit from our discussions with developers um, that that was an initial reaction some sites did stall contractors were pulled off um, but this appears to be more of a rethink of their site management strategies and um, to implement social distancing measures and the majority of developers we spoke to are now back on site um, so we're hopeful that the current construction pipeline will not be severely impacted on too much to summarise, um, I think the under, underlying structural shifts that were pre present pre-COVID-19 um, that's seen the industrial logistics sector grow, they haven't abated. Um, and in our opinion, we feel positive that the current circumstances have actually only intensified this market growth. Um, so in terms of green shoes, I don't think there could probably be any greener at the moment, despite the current the current negativity around around the pandemic i think we're in a position to really move forward strongly um, and i think we'll see that in 2021 on that note um i would like to now hand over to william bellman for an insight into the london and southeast markets thank you rob many thanks good afternoon everybody if I can comment on the London and South East market, which we believe will be less impacted by COVID-19 than some of the regions and potentially quicker to recover, this being due largely to the historical low level of supply and the London dynamics. With less than a dozen existing grade A units of over 100,000 square foot currently available across the South East, we'd expect supply levels to continue to fall. This is through a combination of short-term requirements, returning demand, and as Rob has just outlined, the continuing demand in online retailing, particularly amongst the occupiers with limited current online offering. We're aware of one unit that came back to the market since the COVID-19 outbreak, which was pretty much immediately leased on a short-term basis. We, however, expect there to be limited new speculative development on the big box side, focus being principally on design and builds. We envisage a similar position with a supply of, of prime units between 20 and 100,000 square foot, particularly in the 30 to 50,000 square foot bracket with good yards. 
given the growth in urban logistics. However, secondary units in regional markets, we would expect to be more impacted. Where we anticipate the greatest pressure is on the multi-unit schemes with units of under 10,000 square foot. These units are generally occupied by small to medium sized businesses or SMEs. As we saw from the earlier slides, rent collection figures have been relatively poor. These businesses are not only suffering severe cash flow difficulties, but have been reluctant to take up the government loans. However, having said this, in our opinion, it's unlikely to lead to a significant spike in availability. This is largely as a result of sympathetic landlords working with their tenants through initiatives such as monthly or deferred rental payments, in effect in an effort to, to preserve rental income and mitigate the potential costs of bringing units back to the market in an uncertain world. There'll naturally be some casualties, particularly those ex exposed to the licensed and leisure sector. However, having said that, well, whilst there will be a little, a little more supply, as Len touched on, we're experiencing a reasonable level of interest across our various multi-unit schemes with subsequent inspections, and we anticipate the supply of good quality units being absorbed by this returning demand. The pressure within the sector will naturally have an impact on rental levels and incentives, particularly with landlords focusing on mitigating voids. However, we're not anticipating dramatic changes with prime units holding up reasonably well, possibly with a greater focus on rent freeze rather than rent reductions. In, in terms of construction and demand for land, we're continuing to work on new speculative multi-unit schemes the main obstacles being planning and concerns over supply chain and contract pricing. We would expect this to continue, possibly with a greater focus on prime locations. But having said that, we don't anticipate there to be much of an impact on demand for land, particularly with the interest coming through from alternative sectors, such as the data center and possibly the film industry, as a lockdown is relaxed. If I can then hand you back to Andrea. Thank you, William. Thanks. I think now we, we sort out some of our IT issue. Um, Ian, are you there? Oh, I can see everything is up and running now. Thank you. Just if you, I'm sure you've heard, um, everything has been discussed here. If you can just add a little bit more flavor from an occupier perspective and what you see in the market perhaps also some of the key challenges that you guys are trying to overcome at the moment. Thanks, Andrea, and thanks to Colliers and Len for inviting me onto this webinar. I think it's so important that we're having these conversations and we need to have a lot more of them as we move forward across the next few months. I think just before I start, I just wanted to talk a little bit about Wincanton just to set the scene. So Wincanton, we have about 14 million square feet across the UK and Ireland. We're in about 200 sites. Uh, we've got about 1.1 billion revenue and we have about 26,000 colleagues. Um, the areas of business are defence, retail, construction, energy, containers, and uh, non-food food. And it puts us in a unique position to see the very real effects of the virus. Uh, I think also it's worth mentioning what we've done over the last sort of six, seven years around um, our property portfolio and also Wincanton generally. So it's very, been, very much been about getting the business and the property portfolio fit for purpose, which is especially key now. So we've done a lot of asset management initiatives, uh, disposing of property, re-gearing of leases, making sure that the portfolio is fit for purpose, which is absolutely key now. So what were the immediate effects of the virus? So as you would expect, there was record levels around grocery and haulage, but then other areas such as uh, energy and construction obviously were more challenged. We are seeing that begin to level out now from a grocery perspective. Another interesting point, which I'm sure most know about, is around the ports. So obviously as China was shut down, there was a lack of stock coming into the ports. We now have that surge of stock coming in. 
but of course space hasn't been made because shops etc aren't open so that is a real conundrum that needs to be faced into it is causing congestion um, and also creating a demand for off-key storage so that will be an interesting one to watch I think also what we also saw immediately where there were several long-term requirements they were immediately put on hold probably for six months but then there was an influx of short-term requirements that we had to respond to so how will this play out and what are the challenges ahead i think it is important to say as i'm sure others have said that we are seeing a uh, quiet restart is probably the phrase with very sort of positive steps back into recovery but it is cautious and i think most clients would uh, say a minimum of, of a minimum of six months to get back to pre-virus levels and the other thing to reiterate for us it's all about keeping our colleagues safe and for that so it'll be interesting as we move forward how do physical buildings need to change do they need to change at all but that will need to be addressed how will leases need to change so i think we'll move possibly to demands for resilience over agility so how do you get that resilience moving forward and i suppose a question would be does that mean the contracts need to lengthen to develop that resilience um, I think the other thing is growth in online is pretty predictable. We know that's massive at the moment and that will only continue. And obviously some businesses are more adept to that than others. But I see that will be a focus moving forward. I think the uncertainty for all of us is how behaviours will change. So uh, what have we got used to living without and can carry on living without it? And what do we want to rush out when this lockdown comes to an end and get back into it? And obviously that will dictate the direction we have to take. I think moving forward, just to conclude, resilience will be the key. Um, I remember an analyst saying about a retailer that was struggling that they needed to listen to their customers because their customers were telling them what they wanted. And that will be vital moving forward so whether your customer it's our customer or whether it's our customer's customer we have to be listening to them because they're going to tell us very quickly the direction we need to move and i think a plea to everybody in this call we always talk about collaboration that will be absolutely key moving forward because whether it's how the leases are written how the buildings are built how the contracts are drafted it will need everybody collaborating to get us through this. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Ian. Um, interesting points you've raised. Um, yeah, collaboration will be key to navigate this uncertain and charted water going forward. Now, if I, I might introduce you to John Sullivan, um, based in the Northwest in Manchester, who's gonna be talking about the latest changes, how the St. Elizabeth market is actually gaining momentum. Please, John, you go on. Thanks very much, um, Andrea. <clears throat> Hi everyone, Agent Orange here. I'm gonna to touch on the Northwest market and the emergence of the uh, sale and lease back um, option. Just touching on the market, we've had short term requirements come in and some of these have been satisfied, uh, notably AO.com taking 110,000 square feet at the Cabot's Quorum Estate Scheme, Crew Q110 on flexible terms. Um, DFS, they're reportedly looking at 149,000 square feet at the Knight Frank Investors and Harworth Estates Multiply Scheme at Logistics North Bolton. And in Hermes Parcel Net, they're another one that are looking at 30 to 60,000 square feet between. Bolton and Haydock. We've not seen a slowdown in the larger requirements in the region. In fact, two of those requirements so we're dealing with totaling over a million square feet continue with their acquisitions despite the unprecedented times. Um, because of the high demand in the online retail sales and grocery, we have seen a number of new requirements come into the Northwest of around 200,000 square foot plus. Hook Group and Hello Fresh, to name a few. The majority of the smaller requirements um, have been put on hold until there is a clearer picture with regard to the pandemic, 
pandemic and the economy. However, there are deals still taking place and we have recently put two units under offer at our new build scheme at Carrington Gateway in Greater Manchester for Highmore. Developments already in construction continue despite this supply chain issue and they'll be in a great position to take care of the demand when the economy recovers. Now I want to touch on the sale and lease back. We are seeing occupiers who require immediate, immediate cash injection into the business. They are considering sale and lease back options and some retailers like Next, M&S and Matalan are considering this on certain buildings within their portfolio. So why should they look at this sale and lease back option? There's advantages and there's disadvantages. Advantages, well, it converts property assets into capital without the need for the occupier to lose control of the building. It avoids costs usually associated with conventional debt financing for real estate and transactions such as valuation, brokerage and bank commitments. Rental payments are tax deductible. If there is borrowing on the asset, it will move the associated debt from the balance sheet and improve the company debt to equity ratio. There are, however, some disadvantages. Um, any future appreciation, the value of the property is no longer available to the seller. The company no longer enjoy the value of the property as part of the sale of the business. And there are instances where if the property has been owned for a long period, the tax implications may be detrimental and would need to be assessed before any deal is entered into. So if you are looking for an extra source of cash and are considering a sale and lease back, it is crucial to take count of the advantages and disadvantages to determine if it will work for your commercial property. It is also important to examine that other options available and avoid the common pitfalls by asking your commercial agents, hopefully colleagues, with the help from your legal and financial advisors also. We certainly see opportunities for both occupiers and investors looking at the sale and lease back options in this current market. And that's all from me. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Tom Watkins in the southwest and he's going to talk about the trade counter market. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Good afternoon, all. Uh, I'm just going to briefly touch upon the market down here uh, before giving uh, you all an update on uh, trade counter occupiers. Obviously, it comes as no surprise that the market is very similar to elsewhere in the country. Um, but if we just sort of briefly look back uh, to Q1, uh, industrial take up in Bristol during the first quarter of 2020 uh, was up on the same period last year with about 342,000 square feet let or sold in a total of about 36 transactions. Obviously, the COVID-19 crisis is uh, inevitably going to affect the take up as companies focus on the matter at hand as opposed to their relocation plans. But notwithstanding this, um, I think the fundamentals of the Southwest market industrial sector remain strong, which is predominantly built on um, a lack of available stock and pent up demand. I mean, we're still seeing deals happen here um, sort of under 10 and 20,000 square feet. Um, and I'm aware of, you know, larger lets that are still rumbling on, uh, albeit they're at a slightly slower pace than before. I mean, the type of active tenant seems to be um, the R&D sector, which is uh, well, particularly resilient at the moment. In addition to this market update, I thought it'd be useful just to give, um, give you a little bit of an update on the trade counter market. I mean, generally, uh, most have already started to gear up the opening of stores, uh, but they've naturally adopted certain precautionary measures. Uh, Screwfix were one of the first, I think, to start a click and collect operation on essential items only. Um, but as I understand, there's still no cash taken in terms of on-site purchases. And I believe Toolstation have followed suit as well with uh, click, and, click and collect only too. Um, so I think in both circumstances, I understand that no one can actually enter the threshold of the premises, so instead they're just queuing up in the car park. Uh, Howden's, I believe, have now opened around 250 stores as well. Uh, initially, they're only open to contract-related work, um, but they've started to relax their policies over the last sort of week or so, uh, and they're, be um, they're beginning to service some of the general public, but limiting trade only to those uh, who are trying to finish off projects they started pre-lockdown, as opposed to new projects. Uh, and I think Magnet have actually adopted the same opening practices as well. Uh, Greg's announced, I think, this morning that they're, they're opening about 20 stores in the northwest as a bit of a trial um, from next week. Uh, they hope to, I think they hope to open about 700 shops by the start of June and then aiming to be fully operational uh, from, I think, July. Uh, just moving on to Builders Merchants. 
I gather uh, some builders merchants are also reviewing whether they start to fully reopen stores for bulkier items, uh, presumably on the back of you know, a bit of construction activity. The likes of Travis Perkins are currently op uh, only open on a sort of call and collect or delivery basis. But as you may have seen in the press, B&Q have physically opened around uh, 155 stores in addition to their click and collect service. Uh, but as you'd expect, they've already adopted certain precautionary measures. For example, I think they fitted Perspex screens to checkouts. Um, they've got two metre floor markers to indicate the distance that shoppers should maintain from each other. So this could well be a benchmark for trade moving forward, but it remains to be seen. On the whole, uh, I think most trade occupiers st um, still had their new acquisitions on hold. This is likely to, um, or this is unlikely to resume until the main function of each company has actually started to fire up again. And more importantly, um, until the government restrictions have begun to relax to allow uh, inspections and surveys, etc. So that's all from me. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Ian Davidson to cover West Scotland. Thanks, Tom. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, West Scotland is Scotland's largest industrial market, accounting for 63% of total take-up last year. Prior to the pandemic, the market was in reasonably good shape, with tightening supply, about 6.5% availability, together with robust demand and limited development, resulting in good rental growth over the last few years. It's fair to say most people came into 2020 relatively optimistic about the year ahead, off the back of December's election result and a bit more clarity surrounding Brexit. Then along came COVID-19. Clearly, social distancing is having an unprecedented economic impact. Post-lockdown, I think what we've witnessed in West Scotland is very much a tale of two markets. The small, medium, sub-30,000 square foot size range and larger 30,000 square foot plus. Contrary to historic trends, the larger size ranges seem to be faring significantly better than smaller units. Generally, new inquiries for sub-30,000 square foot units have all but ground to halt, particularly sub-10s, as small and medium space occupiers are preoccupied with the business challenges from the outbreak. On a positive note, many of these companies are telling us that they intend to be back in touch as soon as things start to get back to some form of normality. Also, the majority of new small lettings that were pending prior to the outbreak have been paused rather than cancelled. Um, postponements have ranged between two to six months and landlords have in the main accepted these delays under the circumstances. The larger end of the market is holding up pretty well. Um, I'm pleased to report that we've completed two 50,000 square foot plus deals totaling 125,000 square foot um, post lockdown and I've put another couple of buildings totaling 200,000 square feet under offer within the last week. Mirroring the rest of the country, a feature of the last four to six weeks has been the new COVID-19 related short term storage requirements for the likes of healthcare equipment, well documented PPE, surplus retail stock or surplus manufacturing components. Whilst inquiry volumes are down, the requirements that have come to the market recently seem genuine and indeed immediate. We have active interest in many of our larger buildings. For example, we're marketing approximately 85% of the available floor space within Eurocentral, Scotland's premier big box distribution location, and are currently having active discussions in most of those buildings. We have, of course, been monitoring existing under offer deals very closely and are encouraged that to date only one larger deal of 30,000 square feet has fallen through. That said, Several occupiers have made approaches to renegotiate terms and whilst headline rents are holding up and in my opinion will continue to do so given very tight supply, incentives are in some cases, albeit not all, increasing slightly. In truth, it's still very much a watching brief as it's still early days in this pandemic. Much will depend on the length of the lockdown. However, assuming we get back to some semblance of normality relatively quickly. My own opinion is that the industrial sector will weather the storm in the short term and show resilience in the medium to longer term. 
It's likely to be a beneficiary of current events due to an acceleration of consumer behaviour further towards online retail, and some occupiers may question the benefit of just-in-time delivery and decide to alter their supply chain strategies to more localised storage and indeed production. That concludes West Scotland, so I'll now hand you over to Lewis Pentland for his thoughts on East Scotland. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks, Shane. Uh, I think time's marching on, so I'll, I'll keep this brief. Um, in terms of the market pre-pandemic, I'll not repeat everything Ian has said. Uh, supply stats largely reflect that of the West, and we've witnessed similar rental growth over the last few years. Whilst our 2019 take-up was down slightly year on year, we recorded substantially more inquiries, which I had thought may lead to increased take-up this year. One difference to the West to note would probably be the level of activity below 10,000 square feet, which we find made up 90% of the lettings in the East. Out with a handful of lettings over 20,000 square feet, the activity at the larger end of the market was dominated by sales to owner occupiers. And we were seeing uh, an uptake of inquiries and sites from occupiers uh, seeking to build their own units in the absence of suitable leasehold stock. So how do things look at the moment? Uh, I would echo Ian's comments on the smaller end of the market. Without un, uh, any certainty on time scales, uh, most occupiers are waiting to see what happens. Uh, thankfully, we've only lost a couple of lettings with the majority being put on hold. On the development side, we're involved with four or five new build starter unit schemes, uh, none yet on site, but encouragingly, there are no plans for any of those to be delayed. Going forward, I think there may be a chance for developers to pick up larger vacant units for refurbishment and subdivision, and they may find less competition from owner-occupiers than usual who are trying to adjust to their own circumstances. Uh, we'll certainly be keeping a, an eye out for any such opportunities. Lastly, uh, I would agree with Ian's sentiment. I think we're reasonably well placed to weather this storm, given the strength of our market pre-COVID and coupled with the nature of the uh, businesses that many of our occupiers are in. Time will tell uh, and uh, we'll see what happens. But thanks for listening and I'll hand you back to Andrea. Thanks everyone. Uh, as Lewis just mentioned, we are close approaching the one hour limit. So we still have a, a few minutes for some questions from the audience. I've seen a few questions have been submitted. So, well, do I I'll hand you over to Hannah Zitran, who will be sifting through some of the questions and, and ask the panelists. Please, Hannah. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's been a very interesting webinar, but um, we've had some really interesting questions from the audience. Um, so I'm firstly going to direct um, the more occupied higher questions to Ian Henderson. So um, Ian, um, someone has asked, um, from um, an industrial warehouse um, occupier perspective, are units um, um, that landlords generally offering rent holidays to tenants on existing tenancies without negotiating some sort of payback of that money? For example, are they offering lease extensions, delayed payments, etc.? Thanks, Hannah. Uh, that's a great question. We're obviously having a lot of conversations with our landlords and different proposals are being made. I think it's fair to say they all centre around deferral of one type or another and we have yet to make a decision. Um, I think the important point with it though is just to reiterate is the start of a conversation, uh, a conversation that needs to continue. So whether that's about rent or occupation or new buildings um, you know we need to carry on having that conversation across the next weeks and months. Thank you Ian and um, someone else has asked um, you know from your own experience which property type sector or industry and size of company would you say is faring the best and worst from this COVID-19 situation at the moment? I think um, I think it's fair to say those that are most agile that can respond the quickest to the changes because those changes are coming so quickly. I think from a uh, business perspective, a trading perspective, as I said before, it is very, very difficult to say um, because 
in very simple terms we we don't know you know some things that we have lived without across the last few weeks we will continue to live without um, as we come back out of lockdown and other things we will rush back to and all of that we will find out across the next few weeks and months i think the main thing is as i've said before we have to listen we have to listen to our customers and respond quickly okay thank you and um one last question for you ian um will vertical warehousing um close to city centers um, become more of a trend in years to come do you think and do you think that home deliveries um that are now becoming more of a major feature of our everyday lives are here to stay um i think so i think the it was already great gaining traction principally around london i think whatever the building multi-story whatever the type of building every customer requirement we have is different it just needs to be fit for purpose that building it needs to work i think another interesting point will be how buildings that become available that are not traditionally logistics buildings can be repurposed and i think that will be very interesting to watch okay thanks very much ian um, and now on to um, more of a research led question um, so um, Andrea and Len you might want to jointly um, answer this perhaps but um, how quickly do you think we're going to see recovery um, within um, industrial transactions so that's looking at the investment and leasing market. Thanks uh, Hannah I think shall I go first from an agency perspective Andrea and then you can go uh, forward from a research sort of perspective um, if we talk about the capital markets first I think actually that will recover more quickly in the volume of transactions because when we get back to um, a more normal environment, I think the flow of money will happen more quickly than maybe the volume of deals from an occupational perspective. And I think um, if we're talking about, we talked about it earlier on the investment side that we believe if a prime multi-let or big box came to the market now, which is in a good location, good building, good tenant on a decent 15 or 20 year plus lease, um, we think um, you know, that would get a very sharp, if, record, if not record yield. So I think from an investment perspective, it's gonna be slightly quicker. I think from an occupational perspective, I think it will be slightly slower because actually there are going to be uh, more casualties. Uh, and because of that, uh, my best guess is for when we get back to a normal work environment, um, where we are back at work, uh, the social distancing has elapsed or is not at the same degree as it is now. My view, I would say it's going to be four to six months minimum from when we get back to a more normal environment before the deals flow at a similar rate as they were before. Um, on that note, Andrea, I'll hand back to you for more of the research side of things, but that's from the agency side anyway. Yes, yes, very quickly because again, I'm conscious of time. I, I think, I mean, there are two main uh, factors that have been driving growth in the industrial GCS sector. The first one, of course, has been a good growth, moderate growth, and then, of course, the growth of online commerce. So if we base the, our forecast um, off the back of an economic recovery, in 2021, we should see activity picking up again. And particularly because occupiers are looking to to get some benefit from from the growth of online commerce but from a from a capital markets perspective at the moment we will see some cash rich uh, investors trying to to seize some opportunity at the moment and while um, some of the uk institution of prop calls etc are trying to assess the fair value of different segments or subsectors we should see yields holding up well particularly for 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 prime assets so all in all in 2021 as the recovery bounces back we will see more money inflows particularly overseas investors on that note uh, i think we run out of time we we have a lot of questions here so i i try to keep it short what we'll do, we'll, uh, we'll uh, get back to you singularly, either by phone or email, so that we can actually engage further. Um, on that note again, Len, 
I think uh, we are we are good to go. If you want to say one word before we we close the connection, please do. Thanks, Andrea. And yeah, just a short note to as Andrew and the team have said. Uh, firstly, thank you for Ian Henderson for being our guest panelist and taking time out of his schedule today. Secondly, I want to just say thanks to you all again. Um, stay well and stay safe, and we'll be in touch with you shortly. Thank you very much indeed.